back. He didn't have weapons of mass destruction. He wasn't scaring anybody. He certainly wasn't scaring the Iranians or the Turks or the Saudis or anybody else. It was a state that was on the verge of failure. Now it is a failed state. Failed states cause terrorism. You, know, you can name them. Afghanistan, Lebanon, Somalia. Anytime you, you create a vacuum, it's where people flock to or discontented to fight wars. Osama bin Laden had been saying for years, America wants to invade an Arab country and occupy it, an oil-rich Arab country. He had been saying this. This was part of his propaganda. So what did we do after 9-11? We invade an oil-rich and occupy an oil-rich Arab country, which was doing nothing to threaten us. The only real connection is that having invaded Iraq, um, we are very likely to make it a focus of terrorism. We are likely to produce what the president has said uh, Iraq represents, namely the central battlefield in the war on terrorism. Why? Because we've sent a lot of Americans into a place where they're sitting ducks for people who think the only good American is a dead one. Not be governed by Americans. I don't care what the intention is. I don't care if we truly want to build a democracy. It cannot be ruled by a foreign power. We, as as the the one indispensable nation of the world, as as we we characterized ourselves for so long in the last administration, cannot contemplate that possibly someone else might not like everything we call the American way of life, and that they would, in fact, welcome us into. Uh, their countries. This may not be the case. The only tool in the toolbox of the Bush administration is military force. Military force is a very blunt instrument. It just doesn't work. We've created more terrorists in Iraq and we haven't even solved the problem in Afghanistan. One of the more ironic effects of the attack on Iraq was uh, to uh, buttress other countries in the conviction of the uh, infamous remark by an Indian general after the first Gulf War when he said the lesson of this war is that if you, uh, if you have to fight the United States, you better have nuclear weapons. In some respects, it's as if Vietnam didn't even happen. It's as if a lot of our leaders have suffered some kind of, of uh, historical and political lobotomy. And that's frightening. And every American should be concerned about that because the United States ultimately is supposed to be an exemplar for the rest of the world. We are supposed to be, in Ronald Reagan's words, that shining city on a hill. Well, that, Shining City is looking kind of slummy right now in terms of our image abroad, and I think with, with good reason. We violated, I think, fundamental principles that have guided this country's foreign policy so successfully since 1947. You don't want your president to be seen as a hot dog. And when, when your president gets into a jumpsuit and gets in the back of a jet and lands on an aircraft carrier and then waddles out with his little straps between his legs, and that's not, I mean, you, you want a sign of kind of maturity and not testosterone uh, blasting through when you're talking about uh, things so fundamentally important as uh, sending a nation to war and sending young men and women uh, to their deaths. There is a sense in Washington now that you can't raise uh, uh, objections to this because you're not supporting the troops in the field. I would, I would rapidly point out that uh, unlike almost anybody I know that holds office in this country, I've had two sons in uniform, uh, both of whom have been in combat, and uh, so I don't have to take any nonsense from anybody, nor will I. Mark Twain's definition of patriotism is patriotism is supporting your country all the time and your government when it deserves it. Well, I don't think it's patriotic to stand by and remain silent while your country stumbles into disaster. Well, patriotism is the last refuge of scoundrels, and I think these are scoundrels. Uh, they have no argument now. They have no defense for what they did. The country is in a terrible international security situation that I think is perilous. So they're attacking the patriotism of others. Having been an insider, I know that the insiders don't have it all right. They make mistakes, and indeed, there's more likely to be mistakes and it's more likely to be misjudgment if there is no criticism. 
It was Jefferson who said that, that our kind of government is not based on trust, it's based on, in fact, suspicion. Supporting the Constitution, understanding what's in the Constitution, caring about the Constitution. That's why we don't have a king, because we have a piece of paper. So I think, I think that is uh, patriotism. It's not just those of us who've been privileged to serve actually in the government who are the patriots. It's uh, every citizen who respects and honors the fact that we have such a wonderful country. To suggest that if you have a different viewpoint than any given administration, and or if you're not supporting the president uh, in policies that may be highly erroneous, I don't see that as patriotism at all. In fact, I would argue that uh, any patriot with integrity is going to speak out if uh, he or she feels that, the, that we're on the wrong course. It's not unpatriotic to demand that Congress upholds its constitutional responsibilities regarding the declaration of war. It's not unpatriotic to be very upset, vocally upset, when Congress abrogates this constitutional responsibility by transferring war powers authority to the President of the United States as they did in October of 2002. Listen, when you guys were working NASDAQ and the dot-coms, I was out in Iraq trying to get rid of Saddam and almost got killed for it, and besides almost going to jail. So it doesn't take a whole lot of courage for me to come out against the war, and I did at the beginning, but I was studiously ignored. When we did the first Gulf War, when I came out of Baghdad in 1991, I met with the President of the United States, I met with the senior leadership of both parties, and the one thing that sticks with me to this day is the extent to which each one of them uh, explained to me in very emotional terms the extent to which they had had to plumb their consciences uh, to come to a decision on how to vote on the use of force authorization. It had been a moral decision on their part. It had been one that had kept them up at night as they thought their way through this. We owe our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, and our Marines nothing less before we send them to battle. Sometimes the true patriot takes the unpopular course, but helps their country avoid mistakes. And even if they can't persuade, at least they tried. For me, America is this amazing land of opportunity, of beauty, of, of idealism, of hope. It is a beacon to the world. It's a place of fantastic people. And what infuriates me more than anything else is that this administration has systematically slandered, libeled, blackened the image of America to our friends and allies around the world. Having the authority and the ability to go and wage war is a very, very solemn thing, and it needs to be done with care and with deliberation and with genuine forethought. And I think that none of that was present in the lead up to this entire debacle that we now call enduring freedom. When the emperor has no clothes, you have to have the, the presence of mind and the courage to stand up and say, the emperor has no clothes. The regime is seeking a nuclear bomb. He has attempted to purchase high-strength aluminum tubes suitable for nuclear weapons production. The material sufficient to produce more than 38,000 liters of botulinum toxin. Saddam Hussein had an advanced nuclear weapons development program. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. The K-Report identified dozens of weapons of mass destruction-related program activities. 